Proteins, event loops, and the history of Python generators. Uh, this talk will be 30 minutes, including five minutes at the end for questions. David Mertz. Uh, thank you so much. So this talk is kind of a mixture of things where I get to stroke my gray beard and some other things that are, in fact, very topical and current. Uh, the title you see is about coroutines, event loops, and generators. And in particular, I'm going to get into this topic of how to create weightless threads or green threads that are based around Python generators that are extremely lightweight. There's no switching time and context overhead. And this is actually something that I wrote about embarrassingly long ago when generators were first introduced. And as a result, there were some improvements to the structure of Python generators that made it easier to work with the same sort of thing. Um, but before I get to that, I'm going to talk about some stuff about concurrency in a more general way and why these kind of um, weightless threads and other generator-based mechanisms still make sense. Um, uh, there's just a couple words at the end about some third-party libraries as well, which I'm sure some people in the audience can tell me that I don't understand well enough. Uh, so the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to write this uh, trivial program. I hope people can see the code because there's it's not a, a lot on every slide, but there's going to be a lot of screens with uh, code on them. Um, and this is, you know, trivial and you can all understand what the code does, but I'm going to show multiple ways that we can approach this problem um, in terms of concurrency and in particular in terms of generators. So you can see what the program does is it's just I'm um, looping through a text. Uh, I show you an example in a moment. I'm counting vowels and counting letters and counting, co well, you don't know that I'm counting, but I'm doing something with each of these events, which are letters that are input. But in the more interesting case, imagine that these are events coming in, you know, a network request to do some action, um, you know, HTTP requests or, uh, you know, database events or other sort of things that are event driven. So the thing you want to have in mind is this model of what are we doing with events? Well, in this case, we're just calling a bunch of functions every time we encounter an event. And this is the this is the part that's trivial, but that's easy to imagine it being better. Um, we're just going to count the number of events that we get. And we're using a class here, um, which has three methods. <laughs> um, however, I have to apologize in advance to Jack, because the later slides uh, drop the wrapper, because just for point of code illustration, and I'm, I shouldn't do this. But eventually, I don't. Um, in any case, you can see what this does. Is this is just an object that I create which counts the number of events that are sent to it. And it also happens to be configurable with a name. And I, you can see in the code samples, I give it names like vowel and consonant. Um, but of course, you know, like I say in the slide, imagine this is actually an expensive thing. And now, as I say here, and this is kind of topical to a bunch of presentations today, just idly, it doesn't have anything to do with this talk, but I decided to run my trivial program with CPython and with PyPy, and PyPy is really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's really fast because it, I mean, it's really fast for a lot of reasons, but in this case, it's really fast because it's such a trivial program, and basically the entire time is set up in um, setting up the function call. And you're you know, creating a new function object every time in CPython, and you essentially as much as I understand PyPy is just a go-to and it's inlined. Um, but nonetheless, I was surprised by this amount of difference. Uh, but let's make a start at actually talking about concurrency. So one way we can do it is we can use multiprocessing and we can create a lot of processes to handle these events, which, you know, is not worth doing to process a single letter, but you know, HTTP request or other sort of event that takes a lot of processor time or that, you know, needs to wait on some other event to happen for it to complete, a natural thing to do is to um, make a bunch of processes to handle it. Well, you can see first I create a bunch of objects, well, three objects, um, well, three functions. 
well, other objects technically, we'll see. Um, and I give them names, and it's going to be basically just like the other one. And every time that I get one of these events, I create a process, and I go to that function, and I do what that function needs to do. And there's a little bit of machinery there with starting the process and joining the process. And then finally, at the end of it, I just you know, return a bunch of values from this function after I've looped through. Uh, you can see there's an example. Actually, I just explained that. I probably don't have to talk about that slide more. But I uh, you know, create a process that's a vowel type of event handler and join it and start it. And it takes a while to join it and start it and no time to do what it does. Because what it does is just like we saw before, where it's just a counter. But because we're dealing with concurrency now, one way to deal with that is by um, using this value object that's in the multiprocessing module, which deals with all the issues of lock contention and concurrency for us. But essentially, it's the same thing we did. We're just incrementing a value. And again, pretend that we're doing something else that's expensive. And the first thing I want to say is this is terrible, what I just did. Because every single time that we get an event, we have to launch a new process, and process creation is relatively expensive. And if we do it like in the Shakespeare case where we had, I forget what it was, 5 million or something events, then this is not quick. Um, on the other hand, there's a reason why this might be quite good. And the reason is because every time we get an event, we get to launch a new process, which has all the isolation that we want to it. If this process is a long-running thing, it's going to you know, take seconds and minutes and so on to complete. The process creation time is negligible. So this actually can be a good approach. Um, so I mean, this is a trade-off between how long it takes for a particular task to complete and the time it takes to create a new process. And this is also somewhat operating system dependent. And my knowledge may be out of date here, but probably Windows is worse for process creation than Unix-based systems. Um, well, this is all still at this point more or less perfunctory to getting what the talk's actually about. But it's, I should mention, a way can, that you can handle excess process creation is to create process pools or to you know, let each process that you create do multiple things and handle them as they get new events. And you can see that this code is a lot like all the code that we've seen before. where, But in this case, we've created just these um, three objects that are going to handle events. And we put events into the queue of each process. Uh, and they do what they do. And then there's just a little bit of uh, cleanup at the end where we have to find some way to kill off the process. And in my simple sample code, I just use a sentinel value to send to the process, and then it knows that it's allowed to terminate. Um, this is fairly incidental. This is how we create these processes. And I use this wonderful name tuple module. Um, I also use it for the, I uh, forget what it's called, the letter types or something that was a name tuple. Um, but the point is, we basically initialize a counter, and we associate a queue with it. And this tuple has the queue, it has the counter, and it has the process, and they're all kind of lumped together as values. And then this is the counter that we use. And this counter is the one that starts to be a little bit interesting. Um, it doesn't have a repr anymore, so I'm violating the rules. But it you know, gets some initialization. And some of the initialization is stuff like the queue that it's going to work with. And then calling it just pulls values out of the queue and increments this um, multiprocessor value. And if it happens to encounter a sentinel, it dies. So we have you know, three processes going on, and they each keep accepting events. And there's no process creation time. And you know, if the events are relatively long running, then they take time to actually do this. Um, now, I should mention that multiprocessing, which I guess Jesse is mostly responsible for, I'm not sure exactly who contributed, is this wonderful module that's built to look exactly like threading looks. And so, in fact, we can do the exact same thing with threads that I just showed you, um, with the whole difference being basically what I've underlined there, that instead of calling process, you call thread, and the rest just looks exactly the same. 
um, which is nice. Uh, of course, the difference is that if you do threads, you're going to run into problem with the global interpreter lock, and basically these things aren't going to be running concurrently anymore, which doesn't matter for the example, but does for real things. And so, I don't know, in my opinion or my experience, probably throw away threads most of the time. Uh, and multiprocessing is just so much nicer. Um, but process creation time is slightly more expensive than thread creation time. But now we're going to get to what the talk's about. Um, if you look at this code sample and you kind of squint at it and you don't pay too much attention, you can almost imagine that I've written a generator here. What I am doing is I feed values into the queue and the shared value object stores something. I mean, it stores just a count at this point, but it could store something else. And it terminates when signaled. So we're calling into and we're yielding out of. Um, we're not really yielding, but we're putting something into this shared space, which is a lot like a yield. And in fact, we can make it look even more like that by actually writing it as a generator. Um, I need to do a little bit of change here. Um, it's maybe worth looking at the two bits of code, which are almost the same. But in particular, um, since we're in a process or in a thread, we don't care about blocking. We can just, you know, wait on the queue. I mean, we, it doesn't matter if we block. We're not interfering with anything. It's the other um, concurrent tasks can do what they're doing at the same time, and it's not going to be a problem. Um, however, when we're within a generator, we really don't want to block because it's never going to yield until it gets its value from the, the queue or, you know, from the network, the socket, the database, wherever it's getting values from. Um, so the one significant change you have to make is you have to start thinking in terms of non-blocking I.O. most of the time. And one way you can handle that is, uh, well, this is probably asking permission rather than forgiveness, and so maybe it could be written differently, but we're doing a check. If the queue is empty, then just go ahead and yield right away. We're not actually going to do any work. Um, if that's not the case, then the queue has something in it, and we can deal with it, check for a sentinel value, then do the increment, or the real work that we would actually do. Um, and then we're just kind of returning this placeholder trivial value, which in this case is just the same value we would have returned last time without changing anything. Um, but the thing about it is it does look a lot like, I mean, this is an actual generator, but it does exactly the same thing. We call into it. Every time it returns, it returns the count. Um, it gets things in the queue. It works just like the multiprocessing. Um, this is a little footnote. If you wrote something like the last screen, then uh, you need to be careful because it's going to continue you know, if nothing ever gets in the queue, it's going to return values forever, and it's going to do so in a tight loop, and you don't really want to just iterate over it forever because you're going to freeze up your machine. So you need to do something else, like take a few things from it with iSlice, which is a nice way of looking into iterators, or, um, you know, check whether or not you've got the same value successive times in a row, or instead of sending back the same old value, send back some you know, I'm done for now value um, as a marker. I call it empty here or whatever. Um, so, so you have to watch if you're doing non-blocking and not just, you know, um, loop rapidly. Um, so this is kind of what I just said, uh, but it's worth pausing on just a bit. Um, I've made it so that I can use multiprocessing and I can use generators and they look a lot the same. And I would propose, then, that it means that in a lot of cases, we can substitute these much lighter weight generators for what we would do with multiprocessing. Um, I'm going to talk about coroutines in a moment. And here I list some pros and cons, um, which I just read. But I mean, it's, it's cheap to create generators. It's free, essentially. It's really easy to write. It encourages an asynchronous style, which has lots of good advantages to it. Um, on the other hand, it really doesn't play nicely with cores and 
you know, multiple CPUs, and uh, it, there's no mechanism currently. I mean, maybe the magic PyPy folks will create something for us with, um, you know, software transactional memory or some other mechanism, or it can. But right now, as long as you're um, basing things on generators, you're basically stuck on a core, which isn't, of course, to say you couldn't spin off processes, each of which have a collection of generators within them. Um, so now I want to talk slightly abstractly and get into kind of what the mechanism is um, about uh, coroutines. Where are we at? Um, so actually, for a long time, since Python 2.2 in 2003 or so, we had this wonderful addition of uh, the yield keyword and the ability to create generators, which are these resumable functions that remember their place. And one of the things that enables is for you to write coroutines, which is not really a construct we think about in most programming languages. Um, and the idea is, as in the picture of people can see it, but you imagine a couple routines and each routine within its flow says to branch into some midpoint into the the last point of execution of another routine. Um, and that one can continue from there, and if it likes, it can... That's remaining. Okay. Um, it can, you know, branch again to somewhere else. I, I should go a little faster. And so I show the example. This is the Python 2.2 example, uh, unless for... Well, I guess they didn't have the true keyword, so it's not really Python 2.2, but... Um, and, you know, the example is we, you know, print an A, print, then branch over to the other routine, print a C, bounce back and forth between these things. Um, but what we need, um, I didn't make that on this slide, but so what we need is just a little bit of a trampoline that uh, um, asks the yield value, where do you want to go, and then goes there with this called a current next that's at the bottom, if you can see that. And uh, here I kind of similarly do a sentinelish thing that um, there's a special value that says, get out of the loop. Now, folks here might know about PEP 342 and think that coroutines were invented with PEP 342 because it has the title coroutines via enhanced generators, um, but that's not true. It doesn't really do anything in PEP 3. It's, an, it's a nice enhancement to the language, but it doesn't really do anything functional here. You still need a trampoline if you're going to have coroutines in Python, you know, 3.3 three or recent. Um, and there's, therefore, they're still only really semi-coroutines. They're not coroutines. There's no direct branching. But still, it's nice. But, but I, I guess I'll look at this fairly quickly since I don't have so much with time. But um, let's imagine, though, I think this is kind of worth looking at, and I hope people can see the code and it's large enough. But what if we were to try to write a language which looks like Python, but actually did have coroutines directly with no trampoline? It might look something like this. We might have a command like switch to this other routine and send some data there. And this, in this hypothetical language that I obviously haven't defined the semantics rigidly for, uh, does that. It sends a value, and you can see that what it prints off is slightly different. It prints the value that's being sent along to the other routine, and then the other routine does something, which is just you know, printing some more values and what's passed to it. Um, so this, this could be an OK language, but it, it's not Python. Um, in real Python, we still need the trampoline. Um, we can express it slightly differently than the hypothetical language, but one easy way to set it up is to yield not just the value that you're passing amongst the routines, but also to yield a target. And I, you know, could have somehow marked it specially as target, but, or make it a dictionary or name tuple or something that had target as a member. Um, but in any case, you can see that what a routine wants to do is it wants to pass control to R2 and send the value A and, uh, you know, producing the same thing we saw before. There's a little bit of priming that needs to be done. Before you can use a generator, you have to, you know, kind of create an instance of it, and then you have to actually call next once so it can start accepting values. And, um, but the trampoline's exactly the same. It's just, you know, 
get the target out, uh, send the data there, go there, and after you're done with these iterator loops, you stop. Um, this is kind of semi-real, but I've tried to give an example that's more than just you know printing one letter and or two letters or whatever and getting one piece of data. But typically, what we want to do is we you know wait for something on a database, a socket, a queue, something like that. Do some processing, maybe pass control to another task. Um, you know, but maybe we want to make decisions on which other task we want to go to. If it's this type, then go yield to stage two, and if it's that type, yield to stage three. So this is not, you know, real code quite, but it's, it looks a little more like real code. And also, it doesn't just go through once, it loops until it has a reason to stop. Um, but now I want to talk a little bit about coroutines and weightless threads. And weightless, I mean, people talk about ultra lightweight or green threads or greenlets or things. Um, and I, a long time ago, coined this word weightless threads, or maybe I got it from somewhere. But I mean, I kind of like the way it sounds, so I'm going to say it that way. Um, uh, but this is what I'm going to show you first, is actual coroutines, just like the examples we were seeing before. In order to have this more general purpose trampoline, uh, we could imagine we set up this this function that you know is our universal coroutine trampoline that you know is important in all of our programs that are coroutine based, and you could pass it in a bunch of generators and you prime the generators appropriately, and you do a little bit of setup code, and then you have a trampoline that looks exactly like the ones we saw, which is trivial. Um, you can see I made one little change here, which is kind of nicer in practice and it follows in the other examples, is that rather than having to pass the actual object that you're, you know, the initialized generator that you want to pass control to, you could just use its name. And names are things that are easy to work with. And, you know, to do that, I keep a dictionary around that has a correspondence between names and the generators they correspond to, or the coroutines they correspond to. Um, if we want to change that and use what I call weightless threads, we just have to make a little bit of change. We have not a trampoline, but a scheduler, although those words aren't really that much different. Um, but in particular, we don't let a, a particular routine that's passing control out of itself to control directly where flow control branches to, but we you know, use the scheduler to decide on a you know, fair basis, uh, round robin basis, whatever, um, on some scheduling algorithm where control passes to. But we do set up here a facility where you can still pass data in the very similar way to what we were doing before. So you imagine those, those toy um, generators that we had before, and they're passing data with a certain target in mind. But here we just keep the data in a, um, a default dict, but, you know, in a, a list of values that are targeted to that particular, you know, weightless thread, and it'll deal with it when it gets uh, control again, and whatever happens to be, you know, uh, targeted for it, it will handle appropriately, which may be nothing, and it may be a bunch of things, but so it's going to get there, and it's going to have the values that were targeted to it, um, which is, you know, a lot like real threads. Uh, so what do I do here? Oh yeah, so I, here's my weightless version of the counter program that we saw a bunch of times before. Um, or well, the, the test loop that does it. We initialize a bunch of these generators, I mean three of these generators, which are like these um, process in the pool. Uh, and we give them names that again indicate the type of events that they handle. And in each case, we just send the event to the generator. Um, you know, vowels get vowels and consonants get consonants, and then after a while we're done and we return something. Uh, and he here's a thing that just makes working with these kind of generators, coroutine, weightless threads a little bit easier. If you make just a little teeny decorator, which I stole from David Beasley in some presentation he gave on generators a few years ago, um, and using them as a like a pipeline, which is it's a nice presentation if you want to look it up. Um, anyway, so the, assuming you have that uh, decorator everywhere, then setting up your generator counter is trivial. 
It's, you know, you make a loop, you yield something. Um, in, you know, better practice, we would actually do something with the value that was yielded in rather than just increment a counter, but, you know, we could do something sensitive with that event that made sense. Um, however, you know, continuing my example from the other parts of the talk, this isn't actually weightless threads, it's not actually coroutines, it's really just an event loop. Um, we could modify the example a little bit, so it was uh, real coroutines the way that we saw the trampoline, or that it was real weightless threads. But in particular, the difference in this kind of generic event loop is that um, there's no reason for the particular event handlers to send data to a particular other event handler in, you know, my just counter example, and so it doesn't do that. It just, each one handles the events it's received, but it would be easy to modify this code just a little bit so that, um, you know, you carried around these targeted values once you got back into a, you know, thread generator. Um, oh, I do mention that this is even faster than the very first slide, or second slide, or whatever you saw with the callout tests, um, because generators are really cheap and there's no there's not even the function call setup, let alone the process setup and stuff. Um, it's a lot faster in CPython. It's about the same in PyPy. Um, I guess I have a few minutes. So there's a thing that's coming up, which is pretty neat, and it relates to my talk, and I just think um, I'll mention it. When we get Python uh, 3.3, in which the alpha came out a couple days ago, we have this um, new syntax about generators that um, lets us, uh, well, like the title says, delegate to a subgenerator. So it doesn't do anything functionally different, but it does let refactoring happen easier. So, I mean, in the, the very simple one, you know, looping over a generator and yielding each value can become expressible as yield from that subgenerator. But it also handles sending, it handles throwing, it handles the closed call that you can do on an open generator. and. Uh, it makes it easy to factor things out. In particular, here's, you know, very simple, but you can see how the factoring works. You imagine that the inner loop, the one with J over it or two, does something complicated and maybe something that you want to do lots of times in different parts of your program. Um, and so you don't want to have to repeat it in lots of places, so you want to be able to factor it out into this subloop generator, and you can uh, do it by just rather than having the sub loop saying yield from it and everything that you would want to happen about the way that exception stacks are handled and uh, control is passed when values are sent in and all this sort of thing um, works transparently. So it makes it, once you get Python 3.3, easier to work with. Um, it, it's a minor change, but it's worth doing. Um, now I mentioned a little bit about uh, some third-party stuff, which I don't know that well and I'm not going to talk about, but a lot of people have had basically the same thought that I had in giving this talk. And a G event in particular is very close to the sort of trampolines and um, schedulers that I've talked about, but it uh, puts a whole different syntax around it, and it does something that's equivalent to uh, the PEP 380 that we just looked at briefly. Um, and it but it's a coroutine-based um, Python. Well, well, Greenlets is the coroutine stuff, and gevent is around it to deal with network events. And, um, but in any case, I mean, there's a bunch of these libraries that particularly deal with asynchronous I/O, and think that this is the right way to do it. Um, Twisted is another example, and the deferred object does something like this, but if someone's in the room who really knows Twisted, they're gonna tell me how it actually works. <laughs> well, yeah, my, my moderator's gonna tell me it's not really true. Um, I, I'll just say it's close enough. Um, I have a couple links to documentation. How am I doing on time? A few more minutes? Um, okay, I have time for questions then. Um, I'm just about done here. So I mentioned documentation on uh, these third-party tools, and um, they work differently, but they solve the same problem. Uh, but that's, that's actually my talk, so I guess I kind of rushed through it early. I could have talked about more. Um, 
But questions? Hi. Um, one thing I've always had a problem with these kind of lightweight threads is if somebody goes into like a while true loop and never breaks out of it, um, eventually your whole program halts while that yeah. happens. Um, but Python being a managed language, it could do um, quite easily um, non-cooperative um, switching. Um, have you thought about that at all, or do you just have less bugs in your code than I do? <laughs> well, um, Stackless made an effort way back when it was maintained to do this sort of thing, where it would actually uh, preempt in generators. And I don't think that, maybe someone else can tell me, I don't think any of the other current coroutine frameworks actually have that kind of preemption. They do depend on you being fairly careful around you know, yielding something and not getting caught in tight loops where you're not ready on an event. Um, I mean, in the simple, I could go back to it, but I think people remember, in the simple example I presented, I, you know, I mean, I just, retur well, I return the same value, which is detectable that there's no change, or you can, you know, yield an empty or, uh, but you do kind of have to be careful to guard against this, no events ready, I'm looping forever, and it does require a certain kind of care, and these things like greenlets and twisted deferreds, um, a lot of what they do is they wrap that up so that you don't have to think about that because the scaffolding they provide um, does it for you. Because um, the big problem is there's no way to test for it, right? Because it's the halting problem, whether or not this, without preemption, you can never test that this thing will actually terminate in time. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> it is the halting, everything's the halting problem. So one of the, there's a lot of, as you pointed out, asynchronous frameworks, and there's, there's several more that you didn't point out. Um, one of the issues I've seen with these is that you can't really reuse code between these. If you, if you write even, even a sort of generic algorithm for, say, Twisted, you can't reuse that as a, uh, in, in Greenlets. And I wonder if there's interest in having sort of a common syntax, because they all essentially use PEP 348 and, and yeah. PEP 380 eventually. Yeah, uh, why don't we invent a common syntax and say, if you're writing an asynchronous <coughs> library, here's how it should work, so that you can take the same basic code and plop it into any of these libraries. And of course, I.O. and things like that will be specialized to the library. That would be a great PEP to unify those interfaces. I, I think that's a wonderful idea. I okay. haven't done it. I don't know of anybody doing it, but I, I think it sounds brilliant. Cool. And, and Moshe's going to come up and talk about Twisted and tell, tell us he's doing it. Um, I've just got a quick question with uh, this cooperative multitasking thing with uh, using generators and how it would interact with global stadium programs. So with threading, you know, you do everything, you take the lock, you modify global state, you release the lock. But in a cooperative multitasking system, it's very easy to get yourself into deadlock. If you take a lock, you yield, you still have the lock, and some other coroutine could actually deadlock on that particular case. Or if you don't take locks, anytime you yield, you could have the variable modified from underneath you. Um, well, I think then, in many cases, you can avoid needing to lock at all when you have these because you're just, you know, saving state within the active generator. But, you know, certainly there could be global state that you do need to lock on. But I, the primitives, I did, I guess I'm not on the screen, I can't go back anymore, but um, one of the early examples where I started to use the generator, I still had carried over the use of multiprocessing queue, which, you know, has this locking built in. So, you know, there's some primitives in the multiprocessing module may maybe scattered somewhere else in the standard library where you get, you know, some nice high-level APIs that get you all the locking that you need. So if you, you know, use a multiprocessor queue, multiprocessing queue, or if you use, a, you know, just a multiprocessing value or something, and, I mean, it's not actually technically a global state, but it has that same function of global state, and as long as, you know, that shared object that handles locking for you is passed into each, you know, generator weightless thread that cares about it, then it, that acts as the shared value. And I mean, I think that's almost always the correct way to handle it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if anybody else has questions, you can line up next to the mic. Uh, I, I, do have, like, I, I do have the obligatory comment I have to make about Twisted. Uh, Twisted, so, uh, Twisted does have deferred generator 
which works unsurprisingly very like a lot of the generators you have. Uh -huh. It's kind of an abstraction on top of deferred. And at least the sort of party line that I usually give in my deferred tutorials is learn to use deferred first. And only if you really need that sort of complicated infrastructure, use deferred generator. Otherwise, sort of do it the manual way because you'll get really better performance. You'll understand what's happening better. Mm -hmm. You'll get better exception stacks and stuff like that. Do it the, the manual way in the with, sense with, of writing it yourself like I did or doing well, it differently? With def with just write with deferred. Don't, don't try to like, so with deferred generator, you can actually use the, the sort of core routine structure and, and do yeah. all, the, all the nice things. Um, and we kind of usually recommend it for like, you know, doing it when you have a very complicated algorithm inside the core routine. And otherwise, just attach the functions as needed, so you can do it more manually, but you understand what's happening better, and you get better exceptions. Do you have any problems with like, you know, getting weird exceptions? With, like, what, what happens in the error conditions, in the debugging stage? Uh, yeah, this is why these frameworks grow up. I mean, these are toy examples, and I've played with toy examples, and I've used this sort of thing a little bit in real code that I've written, but kind of not when it gets to the size of wanting a framework yet. Um, so, I mean, I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's, you're likely to get into lots of problems of where exceptions are handled and doing that properly. Um, and, you know, you can write scaffolding for that, but that's what frameworks are. Okay, anyone else have questions? Okay, thank you very much, David. Thank you so much.